112, isn't it? Someone just bought membership. Hello, Kreuzer. Welcome to Britain's Hidden History number 112. Wow, and they said it would never last. Take it away, Arnie. Right, evening all. Uh, Riv Mystic, first online tonight. Thank you. Hello, Wiz Mystic. Hello, Johnny Nigma. His worshipful mayness. Marcel, good evening, Mon Jill. Bronze is quite good enough for <laughs> third place. Well, we are talking about Bronze Age. So that's bang on, isn't it? And I got said, yeah, very exciting. Almost launching the book, all right? I'm oh, so hoping to have a download ready for this show. First part is all done already. Not quite there with the full book. So hopefully, if you're watching this on replay, the download will be up by the Monday or Tuesday, all right? Set myself a deadline, which I really thought I'd hope to get today. Wow, new member. Brilliant. Thank you. Brad Campbell, welcome to you. You're a bard. I've got a bard. <clears throat> people say I'm bard, some of them terrible. Right, so a couple more hellos, and then we'll crack on with the show, just giving people a chance to log in. So Gary Taylor, beautiful evening. Hello, Cole. Hello, Andrew Elan. Sunday, sunny Sunday service. Yeah, it's been sunny and really hot today. Really hot. Hello, Chris Wood. Gavin Lloyd, evening all. Any questions on here? Ian Briggs. I'm outside with a country cream. Lucky you. <laughs> And all the country cream is. There was a country cream. Is that a pint of cider or something? I don't know. Evening, Claire. Evening, Gold Pond. Hello, Richard. Thank you, Arnie. Right, we've got loads of people on in. It's a record last week. Over 2,000 people watched last show before we even got to Wednesday. So that is by far a message, a record. So we've obviously got more and more new people coming every week, uh, which is fantastic. And you're all very, very welcome. <clears throat> I'll try and make it so we... Uh, I, I, it's one of those balances always, isn't it? I'll try and recap what's going on without uh, without sort of boring people who come here every week. Because a lot of people on this show have come to every single one, which I'm sincerely flattered. Thank you, and it's wonderful. People keep coming back. Right, and new members. A new member. Thank you very much. A, a, the original thinking, no relation. New book. Yes, there's a new book. And I'm going to try something different with a new book. There's a fairly small book, so and it's and it's best in colour. So uh, from a printing perspective, it's not ideal because it's an expensive thing to print uh, for a small book. It's one of those books, if you did thousands of them, you know, it, it would be much lower cost. So we're going to try, a lot of people have suggested this over quite a while now, we're going to try doing a, uh, making it available as a download. <clears throat> so you'll be able to download it from the website. Uh, oh, <laughs> and he's just got it you can see we tried so hard to get ready for today's show we now got the, um, the isbn number well done <laughs> a little bit late for me to sort of chat away one hand and just do the cover again with the isbn number on it so just things like that isbn numbers and and there's a bit on part two so what i'm going to do as well is let's just find this a second and i thought because there's a, f a forward on this book that i thought would make or I think, thought, we'll make uh, an ideal introduction about the book and the, um, what this group's all about. So if you're new, or if you're not new, hopefully you'll find this interesting. How do I go full screen for this? Leon, how do I do this on full screen? He's my technical advisor, usually. Is the way of doing it? Um, full screen. Ah, oh, yeah, there, isn't it? Yeah, view. Wait, 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 wait. I'll try view or control L. Yeah, control L, full screen mode. Control L. Uh, why is it you have to be under the age of 15 to understand how to make computers work these days? Isn't it amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> All right, so I'll jump into this. Normally, we start off with a few news stories and updates from the week and things like that. Uh, I've only got a couple this week, not because they haven't been sent through, just I've had oh, one of those amazingly busy weeks. We're all three boys about activities and stuff, and we're trying to renovate a house to get some rental income to have some money coming in, and that's just soaked up all the time, and then trying to get this book done and do it justice and one of the things which i'm going to discuss a bit later i've realized i've had to redraw the cover slightly i have to be really sharp eyed to notice what's changed but what's happened is um this path around here did follow up there but i've been spending my week researching um i have all the fun i've been searching trade winds and navigation and uh, that kind of stuff because <laughs> there's one or two a little idiosyncrasies, if you like, with the journey, which didn't quite work. And Alan, Alan just wrote on it, you know, um, 
that was his name, Homer's gone a bit crazy here or used artistic license, something like that. And he clearly meant this. And I, I think if you look at the trades, we might actually be able to explain that. So this book will have two parts. There's one part is a sort of um, extended essay written by Wilson and Blackett. Then the second part will be analysis of the practicalities, journeys that have been made in open boats, things like that. <laughs> it's, a, it's funny, you come into this Britain Hidden's history, uh, starting to think about um, King Arthur and British history and look into the sites, which is a big, big part of what we do, the main part, really, going around the historical sites and that kind of thing. Uh, before you know it, I'm trying to work out navigational tides around the southern tip of <laughs> South America. I've been on a sailing boat once my whole life, and that was on the River Fowl. And we just went up the river, down the river, and it was great, but that's kind of it. So I'm going to learn fast. Anyhow, so I'll read this forward just to give you an idea. <clears throat> So, the original Odyssey is one of those rare breakthroughs that should be big news and splashed across the media and academic world. And you might be wondering why you haven't heard more about it. Not if you're in this group, you'll know why exactly. If this discovery came from almost any other source, it would be shouted from the rooftops and the discoverers lauded for their brilliance. Even if a long c career had produced nothing else, this work alone would be worthy of recognition in its own right. Such is its significance. Not so for Wilson and Blackett, where the original Odyssey floats like a reed boat that is easily missed as it floats on a vast ocean of their discoveries and seminal work. With so many huge projects to publish, this smaller discovery was left to languish for over 30 years in one of their many dusty old folders that are jammed full with workings, notes and essays across a wealth of topics and subjects, each one amazing. This does need a little bit more proofing as well, so please excuse uh, missing commas and stuff like that. Uh, most of the book is okay, just this forward is there, needs work. Some of this research is included in Moses in the Hieroglyphs, where they demonstrate how to read hieroglyphs, a phenomenal achievement by itself, and then build on that to show that the ancient Egyptians did indeed leave us messages and confirmation of Old Testament characters and events, and that the Bible ties in closer with other historical sources than is generally realised. Amazingly, they also identified the pharaohs, put them in the correct order, and sought out the duplications and phantom dynasties, and, to put a cherry on the top, they also sought out the chronicle, chronological issues that have plagued Egyptian studies since the time of Isaac Newton. You might not be aware of this, but it's long known that all those dates... It's crucial because the Egyptian timeline chronology is what we use to date almost everything else. All that is in just one book, a work that should mark the end of the despair expressed by Oxford Egyptologist Sir Alan H. Gardner, FBA, uh, who wrote, What is proudly advertised as Egyptian history is merely a collection of rags and tatters, a tragic situation that would be resolved if Wilson and Blackett's work received serious ac academic attention. The Trojan War of 650 BC progresses things even further and returns this most pivotal event in ancient history to its correct place in the world's timeline, over 500 years more recent than is generally presented. This is crucial, seminal work, as this date fits the historical claims of the Romans, Jews, Franks, and most importantly the British, whose history has been perverted and mangled to fit the political and religious ideology of the 17th to 19th centuries and has been carried on with ever since, the official mantra being that the Trojan War never took place and was a figment of Homer's imagination. The nihilistic logic is that if the Trojan War could be claimed to be an imagined event, then all of the rest of British history can be declared a myth as well and swept away into the myths and legends box to be hopefully forgotten about a trick that came very close to succeeding, almost there. As well as redating and explaining the events, Wilson and Blackett also identify the historical characters represented, explain the Egyptian connections, and break down the political and military struggles of the ancient era while they are at it, including who Helen was and why the Trojan War took place in the first place. It is against this background that the story of the original Odyssey, as this book emerges and it can be understood how it has spent over 30 years languishing in a dusty old folder under the threat of being lost forever. However, even though these amazing ancient world achievements would be enough to have kept a whole department busy for decades, it's only a fraction of the work completed by Wilson and Blackett. Their first interest and starting point was the forensic 
exploration of the physical and written evidence supporting authentic Welsh history and British history. Starting in the Arthurian period, it was the evidence discovered it was the evidence that they discovered that led them along the ancient migration routes to the dawn of written history in ancient Babylon, with stops at Anatolia and Egypt along the way, and the sort of discoveries that you are reading now. Sadly, the political opposition to their work on British history has meant that their work on the ancient world has also had to be suppressed and banned from the pantheon of acceptable works. The fear apparently being that any suggestion of acceptance of their work in one field might be seen as tacit acceptance that they have some credible claims in another. <clears throat> so it is that we find ourselves with the treasure of the original Donacy, <laughs> the original Odyssey, not a diamond in the rough, but a gem amongst the jewels. So there you go. All right, and there's a picture, a couple of pictures you might recognise of Wilson and Blackett back from the 1980s. So... So we're going to go back onto that in a second. All oh, right, now I'm really stuffed now. I don't have my IT guy here. I've got to return that to normal size page. What am I doing? <laughs> right, let's try to catch up with some of the comments. Uh, yep, yeah, it's very warm, yep. Yeah. Uh, right, who else we got on there? Uh, new book, yes, the new book is going to be all about this journey around the world. Got some great pictures to show you. Uh, well, I like the pictures. Uh, right, hang on a second. Can someone ask Ross to reach out to get Robert Seifer on regarding the Babylonian connection to Cymru, please? I asked him about it on the stream. He said he covered it, covered it, but no harm you asking him. Well, if you can put me in touch, I'd love to talk to him. That'd uh, be great. Uh, let's look at any other questions on that. Oh, hello, Legless. Good to see you here. Hi, guys. Loving this stuff. Reading King Arthur Conspiracy again. So much info and can't wait for this one. Yes, King Arthur Conspiracy is out. There's loads of other books. Just go to cumroglyphics.com and you can find the books there. Robert Zephyr's research falls flat when it comes to real British history, says DJ Lee. <laughs> yeah, I doubt he... Well, he says he, he places the Maddock voyage in the 10th century. I can imagine that he would do that. Doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if anybody's worked to comment on the rest of it, though. Uh, right, okie dokie. Let's just do, um, and we'll dive in as quickly as possible. So it's got a couple of things to show. I'll tell you what, I'll go straight to the website, please. Yeah, there's only a couple. Right, so here's one uh, courtesy of Jane Moyer has sent us this. There is an offer that we can join uh, this organization for free, which is the Society of Antiquaries of London. So I'll Put the link in the description. I think you just go to their website. If you look at um, sal.org.uk. And this gives you loads of access to loads of books. Which can be very useful. Um, the ask is, one of our affiliate members, you'll have access to our stunning Burlington House location. Location? Ooh, does that mean I can actually go into the house? Ooh, and use the largest antiquarian library in the country. The Society of Antiquari Antiquaries. Antiquaries? Antiquaries. It's one of London's hidden gems. Sorry, I'm a bit croaky, aren't I? Hang on a second. For over three centuries, it's worked to bring people together to study the material evidence of the past. Wow. Okay, so you can have a look at that. Uh, home to over 40,000 objects. Always loads of comments. Good. Paintings, prints, drawings. Ah, 130,000 books and manuscripts. Wow, why you should join. There we go. All these free things we get. Okay, so I'm happy to share that. And you can, uh, I think this part is free, or we can join. There's also these other things available. So I don't know if it's a special offer just for us. It Jane sorted out. But I'll put the link up and you can give that a go, okay? Right. Now they should be. Hang on one second. Where's it gone? Hang on one second. Where's my, um, oh no. Oh, oh, I had a bit of, bit of singing lined up. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Trouble is, I've I've I was I've tried so hard to um, get the blinking uh, book ready. Oh, I'd right up to eight o'clock, and I said, "Got to do it! Got to do it! Got to do it! Got to do it!" And it just beat me in the end, and I was gutted. And it's not one of those things you can just stay up all night doing because the show starts at eight, and that's the end of it, or just after it. Right, I just want to share this little follow-up from. Oh, bit loud. Sorry.
this is the scene apparently inside there, Tree Forest Brewery, which I mentioned last week, which has got a story about two in the clock. Let's give a couple of minutes to this. <laughs> oh, oh, that's no good, is it? Thank you, Leon. Go back a little bit. Oh, yeah, we got Moose anyway. Yeah, sorry. Ah! Uh. So there we are, there's people having a good time. The, the land of song and beer. <laughs> so I don't know who's who, but everyone seems to be having a great time. All right, just thought I'd share that just quickly with you there. A Greyhound Through the Thunder and the Lightning. If, I don't know anyone knows this song. I don't think it's a sophisticated song. So I've definitely taken my guitar when I go down there for a pint. Looks like fun, isn't it? Just down through forest there's the brew that to the clog beer. Milky, milky. Hey, die out, die out, die out, indeed. Well done, everyone. <laughs> so, guys, I thought I'd put that as a little bit of fun there. Oh, hang on a second. We're stuck on loads of Facebook things, aren't we? Right, kill that. Okay. Right, uh, just one. Uh, hang on, I'll try to keep up with the chat. Okay. All right, some good discussion going on about history. All right, I'll leave you to that, I think. I'll try. What I'm going to try and do as well is go through the main story and then have a chat at the end where I'll read through the comments that are coming up. And we can have some question and answer, some more chat, uh, ask each other questions, me questions, whatever, okay? Now, I hope you saw the video I popped up during the week. Just give you a quick reminder that yeah. there's this... Is... I don't know if it's just me. It might be just me, but I can't hear you. I'm having this girl on the screen. Can't hear me? Uh, no one else has commented. Can everyone hear okay? Oh, sorry. Just me. Oh, we turned your speakers off. That'll be it. <laughs> I'll probably do it. Right, okay, so here's the environment. This this reminder, if you haven't seen the video I put up during the week, I'm trying to get more videos up this week about history and stuff, all right? Like I said, it's been flat out with uh, the building works and um, trying to get this book ready. I'm failing. Ah, oh, I hate not hit making a deadline. Anyway. Right, so here's this um, historic environment Wales bill that Mark Antony's putting through. It's a good idea, it's very useful, it's consolidating all this legislation regarding the kind of things that we do. Or if you have a listed building, or if you are into metal detecting, you just go there, you click on that bit, and then you can have a look through this lot, all right? It's, I mean, it's proper massive. So um, I'm really hoping that some members in here will be prepared to have a look at that. Even better if you've got some legal background and give some tips. We'll just have a look through and see if anything leaps out at you. Uh, I, there shouldn't be anything new in there. I, I don't know the old legislation very well, so I can't really confirm or deny that. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not offering legal advice. There's my big disclaimer. Ooh. Thank you, dear. Hang on. Try and put this tea down without clattering it all over me. Please don't damage your ISBN number. Don't damage your ISBN number. <laughs> right, thank you. As, but um, the thing that stood out to me is if you do, uh, I'm sure you get a warning or something first, but um, I'd say I'm not a lawyer. But if, if you fall foul of these rules, the, the fines can be really quite substantial and you can get up to two years in prison. All right, I'll just quickly show, uh, where was it? Right about number 60, just quickly. Quick recap, in case you missed it during the week. Oh, sorry, it's horrible watching people scroll, isn't it? Um, right. So here's the ones that... Public access to monuments under public control. This is why how you can get there, when you're going to stop you going there. And then you've got things like, um, if you damage it... There we go. This is the bit I was looking for. So what they call damaging, I'm not quite sure. It's not really defined. But um, if you go onto a site for damaged things, then restrictions on metal detectors. You really should be aware of this. Consent means written consent to Welsh ministers, not just a farmer going, yeah, carry on, but it's okay. And if you notice, if you scroll on down, you'll see 
the, the table of fines and everything is up to two years and it can be quite a lot financially as well. So you really want to be aware of this or before you mess with anything. Okay, I'm not going to have a discussion on that tonight. I put a video up and I will discuss it again some other time. Put the link in that chat, please. Yeah, I will. Hang on, we should put... Ooh. Put his, uh, right, I'm confused now. Right, okay. What do I do now, Leon? <laughs> I need to get back to my document. Control L. And then that one. Right. <laughs> my producers are going after me. Thank you, Leon. Right, I'm not going to read the whole book now, obviously. What I do is pick out a few bits. I'm going to give you an idea. And uh, what I'm going to do first, what I could do, actually, all I could do is get the map out. Right. An original map would be good, wouldn't it? Right. Okay. This, you can have a quick flick through the book, anyways. Give you an idea. It's full of pictures uh, and colors. Right. I'm going to use this map. This is from Wiki Commons. This is just a modern map. This isn't Wilson and Blackie, particularly. Now, to give an overview of what the book is all about, okay? I've also, one of my f new favorite books is the Ra Expeditions Thor Heyerdahl, and there's a similar map on here. Unfortunately, I got this book. I can't remember where I got it for nothing out of somewhere. And this map's really messed up. You can see the trade routes and that drawn in, but it's really ah, not good enough for use. Right, so look at this one. Now then, <clears throat> this map would be great for what we're doing. Now, just to bring people up to speed, if, you, if you're aware, hopefully you're aware, <coughs> that there's this um, amazing set of ancient books, which are supposed to be the oldest books, uh, some of the original books, some of the first writing by Homer or Melesigenes, who was a, sort of a blind writer or poet. And he is said to be in a, um, around sort of in the 650s, 630s, something like that, in the middle of the 7th century. And he is... The story goes, let's start off with a background to this, the story goes that he wrote down the old stories about the, the the War of Troy, the Trojan War, and then the famous journey back home again. So these two books are the Iliad and the Odyssey, which you've probably heard of, and you might have seen the movie Troy and all that kind of stuff. Excellent movie, by the way. I love it. I know a lot of the Puritans who uh, like their classical Greek literature, throw some stones at it. But I think there's lots of stones you can throw in it already. So I <laughs> just enjoy it for it is. Brad Pitt and Eric Banner duking it out on the sand. It's great stuff. And Brian Gleeson wading in, going crazy and slaughtering loads of people. I think it's great. Anyway, <laughs> that's just me. Right, so what we have here, the situation is the journey home. This area is where the Trojan War is supposed to have taken place. Okay, hope you can see my hand floating around there. And I'll just give a quick background on the official line. So what we have is this gap into the Black Sea. I can redo with zooming in. I can't zoom in. Okay. Uh, on the edge of the Black Sea here is the key navigation strategic point. And the war took place between the Greeks over here and whoever on this side over there. Oh, you okay, just nudge me. Right. Now, this is this this is the official story. Wilson and Blackie go through this in Trojan War. If we've got time today, I'll talk more about that and how the roots actually fall into Egypt here. This is the battle. The real war was a, was between the, the Hittite hordes and the Assyrians. This was the main area of combat. Are we doing to zoom in a second, don't we? Oh, we have to do our best. This is the main area, and this was a bit of a sideshow, a bit like in World War II, when you had the D-Day invasions. To us, they're massive. You know, biggest thing in the West in World War II um, June the 6th, D-Day, the landing of the troops, the biggest um, amphibious landing ever. There's a lot of parallels with that and what happened in the Trojan War. <clears throat> but if you look at the details of the fighting that was taking place in World War II, you had about two or three divisions of the um, German forces on the west coast facing us, and then poof, 70, 80, 90 divisions fighting on the eastern front in the main war, which has taken place uh, with Russia. As the old joke goes, the British beat the Italians, the Russians beat the Germans, and the Americans beat the Japanese, which is not a bad summary of World War II, really. And it's a bit like this with this one. This wasn't the major conflict in Wilson or Blackett's view. The major battles were happening all around this area where the superpowers were fighting it out, which is why, when you read Homer's Iliad, reinforcements are drawn in from all over the place, even from down as far as Ethiopia and places like that. They went all the way up to fight this battle, partly because they got no choice, because 
in those t- <laughs> the way in which fealty works is that if um, the emperor turns up with his big army and, and turns up on your borders and says, right, you're going to bend the knee and pay homage or not, what are you going to do? You're going to fight a war, fight a battle, possibly to the death, and end up being dragged around on the back of a chariot with your bits hanging off? Or you might offer fealty to that emperor. Now, when that emperor calls on you to send forces, you then have to send forces. Otherwise, at some point, that emperor is going to come and pay a visit, and he isn't going to ask nicely the second time. And your cities could get levelled, and bits of you could become missing. All right? This is the way it works. So when the emperors have the big war, they call on all their people to come and join in, which is what this fight was all about here. Because this is the key join between these two. And one of the key, the Hellens we're talking about, as those who know Wilson and Black, it will be fully aware, we're talking about the heirs to Egypt, the descendants, the heirs. Because in Egypt, everything was done through the female line, same as seems to be in ancient Greece. So it's the ancient female lines that decide the pharaoh. So whoever can marry the next in line female becomes the pharaoh. So that's why the hand's worth having, okay? This whole thing here it being around Greece makes no sense in its diversion. Now, after the the famous battle and the scenes and everything, uh, the so-called Trojans are declared victorious. Sorry, the Trojans lose. And their Greeks, who are based in the Delta states around Egypt, they're coming home across the Mediterranean. This is where we get to Odyssey, where for some bizarre reason, which people never explained very well before Wilson and Blackett, although others have tried, such as Im and Wilkins, this journey is taken, depending on how you read Homer, between three years and ten years to make a journey across this little bit of water here, which take what, a day or two maybe. And um, Odysseus, who's there, the, the main character, the, the genius, the clever one, he's the one who came up with the idea of the Trojan horse to get behind the lines. He's the destroyer of cities. He's the clever one. He can't find his way home when he's supposed to live in Ithaca, which is about here. So he can't get from there to there. It's so close to get on this map, it's hardly worth showing. <clears throat> so what Wilson and Blackett have done, in their true style, is look at the evidence again. And what they've done, without using this map, by the way, this is something I've, I've got into the sailing side of it, and I've never sailed a boat in my life. So please, if you've got specialist knowledge, you can put me right, please do so. But what I have been doing is studying um, sailing journeys, particularly circumnavigations, like the so-called Magellan circumnavigation, this guy, Thor Heyerdahl, uh, the movements of Polynesians, discover islands, all these kind of things. I didn't expect to be doing that, I have to say. There you go. It's a fascinating area. Uh, right. So Wilson and Black had done is say, right, first of all, we described the first part of the journey. I'll show a bit more detail on this. I just want to give an overview on the map. And then the idea is, and it does say this very clearly, they leave... Ah, oh, sorry, I should explain. Herodotus then talks about another journey... Departing south down the Red Sea, which is this part here, and a circumnavigation. Now, in the past, it's always been assumed that the circumnavigation must refer to a circumnavigation of Africa, which it could well do, except why would it take three to ten years? And also, if you read the navig, there's a lot of navigational tips and clues in Homer, and they don't match with this, uh, which side the sun is and um, long nights. We'll go on to it as we go through the story, okay? So Wilson and Blackett, using a genius, said, well, if they come this way, don't forget, this is huge. I mean, this part here is India. It's a problem with this sort of projection is that it makes India look tiny because it's near the equator. Whichever model map you like. <laughs> it just makes it look smaller, right? India should look a lot larger because as they come around here, the, the Odyssey talks about them sailing south for 40 days. Now, that's impossible in the Mediterranean, right? You're going to crash into Africa, wherever you are. If you look at Eamon Wilkins' model, he tries to say that uh, Homer's journey takes place up in this part of the world, around Norway and Sweden, up here into the Skagerrak, and around Britain, and his circles around it, which does have some, uh, some things going for it, such as the, the double-length days and nights would imply it's near to the North Pole. All right, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that as we go, okay? But again, the distances never look long enough. I've never been very convinced by the argument. Although, we can see 
again, place names Emma Wilkins finds in Britain and this area, which do match the Iliad. So, this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because it does seem, and this is something that uh, Marcel has been working on for a long time and has, has made major breakthroughs, is that we could be dealing with two Trojan Wars. We've got one in the east of England, which Eamon Wilkins talks about, possibly 1100 BC. You can read Marcel's stuff to get more about that. And the second one, hopefully Marcel will do more videos as well, it's been ages. And the other Trojan War, which is this area, using the Greeks from Egypt, and that's where you've got your Achilles and Hector and Agamemnon and all those characters that we know from the films and know so well as the famous ones. And at some point, those two stories seem to have been merged. And also, a third story that seems to have been merged is an explanation of where Homer got this journey from, this, circum this journey home. It just does not work in the Mediterranean. And I'll go into it a bit more detail in a second. Where it does work so if we come down here, we can then follow the... This is where I have to redraw my map. Because uh, the route I did, being a landlubber and not understanding currents and things, was just going to come here. Got to come around this, or, um, around or Saudi Arabia. So, um, just don't get my bearings. Where Abu, where Abu Dhabi was there, I think, isn't it? I'll sit there, where Arnie was born. Okay, so you come around here, following these trade winds. And then you've got this long, 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 long street. This is the long southerly journey down the west side of India. And this is where Wilson Blackett proposed the Mahenjadaro was looted. So we're going to come down there. And this is where we find all these interesting people that Homer talks about, like the cannibals and the headhunters through Borneo. So I would suggest you come down there, and I'm probably across here. It's very crude terms. I've done a little bit more research than this. And then we get to these situations, and then hit into... Australia, uh, and this is where we get the peaceful uh, people they meet and the calming types, and this would seem to fit in with the Aborigines, you know, very peaceful type of people, and a curious thing I want to get onto more, one of the reasons I've been holding up on this book is the Gosford glyphs, the ones found in Australia that we're trying to track down, this is one of the reasons why, because there are hieroglyphs there. I've got no way of telling if they are faked or forged or added or whatever. No way of telling that. Not from here, anyway. I'm not sure how you can tell. But what I can do, through the knowledge we got from Wilson and Blackett of how to read hieroglyphs, and I've got my book on that as well called Cumroglyphics, is we can read what is there. Now, some bits do look a bit strange, like they've been added quite recently and don't make a lot of sense. But a lot of those hieroglyphs do make sense, and they do seem to describe um, a journey and the style in which they're written, everything about them gives you an idea of the, the era, and it also gives you an idea of the people who were doing the, the drawing, they wouldn't have had the same uh, facilities available that you would have back in Egypt when they were doing the hieroglyphs there. And as we talked about, was it, God, where the weeks go? A couple of weeks ago, I think, about the um, things like Rosetta Stone being faked and the, the stones and things like that being carved into liquid rather than solid. So I think it's understandable that they would look different for a lot of reasons. The key is, can you read them and what do they say? And that's another area I'm trying to work on to get done for this book for part two, which is going to be looking into the book. All right, so we come down here. This then is Tasmania, and this is where, <clears throat> this isn't a great map for this kind of thing. This is where we start to get towards Antarctica, and then you've got the whole thing which Homer talks about with um, the days being twice as long and there being no nights and they can't navigate and the reason they can't navigate, and this is where Wilson and Black, it's genius, is because the stars they normally navigate by are up in this northern hemisphere. So when you look up, you see the North Star, gives you an idea, and you can see the plough and, the, you know, the bear and all these. You can work out where you are from using astronomy. But once you're in the southern hemisphere, all those stars disappear, and you've got no way of navigating. And this seems to be the problem that they had. Uh, the problem is you have the wrong map on the screen. You need the Gleason's map of 1862. It'll make sense when you just go, all right, well, shall have a look at that. Um, the reason I got this map is not uh, so much because it's geographical accuracy. What it does do is show the the trade currents. This is the point of this map. Not so much the land, but the way the, the flows work. All right. Um, <laughs> 
Get a lot of people moving away from... Uh, Right, okay, all right, let's carry on. Anyway, let's look at this. <clears throat> yeah, so don't get too wrapped up in this map, all right? It's not crucial to the story. The point of this map is it shows the ocean currents. So if you were just sitting on a raft and floating, this is the way you should go. And it does seem to tie pretty closely with the, the bits of it. <clears throat> We've got here with Thor's map. I don't think you're going to be able to see very well on the screen, but you get an idea. And I'm trying to... If you've got more maps showing... Um, Currents of the world, that'd be great. Because one good thing about a, a, being a download is that we're able then to, um, we can update it. <laughs> it becomes a living project. So we'll do as best as we possibly can and give a complete book to download. And then, you know, later on, you might want to download it again or something. Um, okay, so what we do there. Now, the, then we'll, we'll come on to this again. We'll talk a bit more about it in a second. So this is where we dip into Antarctica. And then we're going to come off east. <laughs> And this is where we sweep up here, hit the South American coast, and somehow they got attacked their way through. Then we're going to come through the, the south southern tip of South America. This is, gets a fascinating part of the story, because this is when you have the two cliffs that uh, Homer talks about, and the crashing seas and all that kind of thing, and the cliffs, the seas moving. Well, this is the point where the Atlantic and the Pacific meet, and it's horrendous Who's for navigation. Yeah, yeah, I've answered that one, yes, it's okay. Oh, yeah. I don't know how false. Perhaps you can explain a bit more why it's false. But anyway, it, it gives a, an idea for what we're doing here. Uh, maps, I know, are very controversial. <laughs> it's very difficult to verify maps. But what this does do explains a couple of discrepancies I think Wilson and Blackett were struggling with. Um, one of them was... they didn't. It, it, <laughs> see, my first instinct, and when I drew the map first of all, is you would then sail up the east coast of Brazil and Wilson Blackett do mention this Brazilian drift but that seems extremely difficult to do it's very difficult to sail up the east coast of Brazil you'd have to sort of tack your way all the way up which would be quite difficult and and what doesn't in the book one of the bits I want to add to part two this is one of the things I have to add to is after going through the Falklands which we come on to they get driven by a westerly wind and then a wind from the south and they get bashed into this coast so I'm I'm saying they might have crashed here somewhere, and then back on. And then they have to come all the way around to the... This incredible journey, it really is amazing. All the way around to the Caribbean, West Indies, which would explain how the tobacco got back to um, Egypt. And then they would follow the trade routes, same trade routes they follow today, more or less, or the aeroplanes follow, for that round there. And then the, this takes you all the way in. So that's the journey, all right? So now you've seen the overall journey, okay? And whether or not they hit the Canaries, or hit the Scilly Isles, all those kind of details. Okay, so some old pictures. Dunk, dunk, dunk. Uh, I'm going to go through the whole of the book now. There's some Herodotus. So the first part I want to look at quickly is... Actually, let's use the next, next map. Uh, hang on a second. So what you get is all the backgrounds, the Egyptian connections, uh, why we've got red-haired pharaohs <laughs> i got the red-haired mummies of uh, is because uh wilson and blackett show you that those mummies one is agamemnon one is menelaos of the red hair and homer describes them throughout as having the ones with the red hair and we can show their journey back so here's one of the things which if you read the description of the journey back after the battle of troy so here's troy there's red uh, black sea this is the narrow estuary, which is so important. Troy around here somewhere. So the question then is, the journey described home clearly is a journey south. And what you have here is one of the choices that uh, sorry, Menelaus has to make on the journey back. We have to go this way or this way. And some of the incidents described are clearly along this coastline. Uh, and you can see the details there. Menelaus is saying for Egypt, the story confirms this, is when he, only five of Menelaus' ships survived the great storm. Uh, five ships are driven by winds and waves. And this is where he loses the helmsman, which is a famous part of the story. And there's the sick ladies. And this takes you then down to... Hang on. That's right. So, right, so there's the, down to Egypt. So here's an example. Here's one of the, um, the mummies. You can get this picture on Wikipedia. You can have a look yourself. And what Wilson and Black had explained and demonstrate in the Trojan War 650 is that this one is Agamemnon. <laughs> so 
So was it Gleason played Agamemnon? I was getting mixed up. I think he was Menelaus, wasn't he? So you can see then, this is the sort of thing we're looking at. Uh, I'll just read a little bit from it. So in the story, Menelaus is upset at the off-handed treatment given to Telemachus by his equerry Etrionus. <coughs> red-haired Menelaus, this red-haired description and so out there Homer's work. They follow follow several other references to red, his red hair. My travels took me to Cyprus, to Phoenicia, and to Egypt, Ethiopia, Sidonians, Arembi. I visited them all. As you'll see, Menelaus is on good terms with the king of Sidon, and so the Sidon reference may indicate trade rather than raiding. It is possible that the account might have been, this is translating the, the old names to new ones, Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudanese, and Eritrea, Arembi. And these expeditions would match with the military expeditions that were made by Seti I, particularly as Menelaus also claims, I saw Libya too. So what we're trying to do here, the point is, he read Trojan War, you know all about this, the, this war, Trojan War, the one taking place in Anatolia, is describing people from Egypt fighting this war. And, oops, excuse me. And um, their roots were in Egypt, and you find Egypt's place where they end up at the end, and you read about it in the, um, the Odyssey. The other curious thing, of course, which makes you think a bit, is over the last uh, couple of weeks we've been discussing how there's a possibility that uh, there's also Egypt in uh, in Cornwall or Wales. <laughs> that really that really turns things around. So we're not the same name twice, or whichever way. Another reference to red-haired Menelaus. The powerful anodyne was one of the many useful drugs which has been given to our daughter of Zeus by an Egyptian lady, Egyptians all the way through it, uh, Polydama, the wife of Thon. For the fertile soil of Egypt is rich in herbs. In medical knowledge, the Egyptian leaves the rest of the world behind. So there's loads of Egyptian references in this book. It seems to tie in. So here we have the original Helen, uh, who's the widow, or sorry, the, the, the daughter, and the widow. There's two Helens. So whoever marries her gets to become Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, and there's the other one. It says uh, Agamemnon. Oh, sorry, Ramses II. Whoop. That slight slippage. These little things like that you have to fix before you make a book available. All right. So you can read all about Tutankhamun and who was who in the seventh century. Let me get to. I want to get back to the journey. Right. So here we go. This is this this map here. Um, a little bit cut off slightly. There's the um, layout issue there. The map continues here slightly to where the battle is. This shows. The conventional, I know it's ridiculous. This is the conventional uh, Odyssey route. It's ridiculous. It's taken three and a half, ten years to get around this small area here. And not only not only that, but you have the other situation is what happened to all these weird people that were mentioned in the book? You got all these um, uh, cannibals and strange people and one-eyed people, all sorts of weird races and events, different climates. Uh, the the days that last, you know, all the, sort of the endless days, the navigation issues. How on earth can this be in the Mediterranean? It doesn't make any sense at all. As it said, says in the bottom there, the conventional view is that it took the cunning and intelligent Odysseus three to ten years to find his way home from within the Mediterranean, and we have passed his house at least twice. <laughs> it's just mad, isn't it? Bizarre. And yet we served up these things, unless you think about it and have a look into it, you don't, you know, no one thinks to question it, do they? Right, so here's the first leg of the journey. Coming down south through the Red Sea. Gonna, now, at the moment we've got this following the coast, but I think it might come more across. There again, any sailors out there, can have a look at this. There's Mohenji Daru. And this was sacked in round about the right time. There's been a lot of archaeology done there. And what Wilson Blackett is showing in the book is that the the looting and burning of that city, which seems to have taken place, would have been done by the Egyptians. And I think the other thing, which um, is amazing, if you have a look, if you get a chance, go through the videos and just type in uh, punt, P-U-N-T, as in punting a football up in the air, and check out the video I put up about that, because I am still getting um, comments, mostly from offended Somalians and Ethiopians, who I will make quite clear again, if anyone's watching this, I have no problem at all with when it's not at all an attack on Somalia or saying that Somalia hasn't got a history or anything like that. Where's your um, where's your buddy from? 
Who's got the some? Saudi Arabia. No, no, we want to, who's coming over next week? Issa. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Yep, no, he's not. Well, he's there now, he's in Saudi Arabia. Where's his mum from? Somalia. Oh, thanks a lot. Great. Name. Never work with animals or children, okay? So anyway, <laughs> thanks, Leon. That was really good. <laughs> Spot the lack of rehearsals there. Anyway, so um, it's not a case of that at all. What it is is that when you read the hieroglyphs, you can look at the hieroglyphs for punt. And basically, it's a it's a boat for hire sign. <laughs> it's, it's like if, if you were driving around uh, a, a village in or town in anywhere in Britain, for example, you'd see all these signs with for sale on them outside the houses. Uh, if you're a future archaeologist, you'd be saying, well, where is this place called For Sale? There seems to be a lot of signs for sale. <laughs> and in this case, because it's boats for hire, the signs always appear in the in the docks, in the harbours. So they keep going. But the logic of it, the, the signs that say punt, nearly all of them are in Egypt. So why would you have signs saying, basically, welcome to punt in Egypt? They should be in Punt land, because the problem now is it. Uh, I'm slightly digressing, but the problem now is there's an area of of uh, Somalia called Puntland, and uh, people become very attached to that name. Although it's just a colonial name given by the Italians, and it's in lieu of the mistranslation of the sign uh, saying Punt. But what is interesting when you look into that and Punt, and you look into the docks around here on the Red Sea in Egypt, is that you find incredible uh, trade goods. A lot of which, a lot of which are from this area. Um, rhinoceros tusks and rare plants and all sorts of things. Now, there's another one, which is um, another theory. Sorry, this is included. There's so many ideas what where punt is. And the funny thing is, it's just a boat for hire sign, more or less, okay? Now, the, the other crazy thing is that some of the... Uh, it's just struck me this. If you look at some of the conventional accounts of where punt is... There's a theory that uh, what we now call Sri Lanka, Ceylon, was the, the destination. There's all the way over there. And the natural reaction is to think, well, it's just way too far. But the more I've looked into these ancient boats and stuff, especially reed boats, that's nothing. As long as you've got the currents on your side, this is the key. It's almost impossible to turn the boats around. You don't have a proper rudder. You don't have a fully uh, operating sail system you're more or less following the current. It's not that much different to being on a raft. All you can do is keep yourself more or less in line and pick up a wind. But really, you're, you're floating on a raft, effectively. Uh, another curious thing I'm going to... Um, so there's a proposed first stage of the journey. So I need to look... I, I, this will be fine for the purpose of this book. But it'd be interesting to check out exactly how you would sail that, rather than if, you know, if you've got an engine. Everything changes with an engine. And this comes down then through Malaysia, and we're going through all these areas. So look again for more evidence for that. You know, there's a little drawing I did for the book. Just saw the shack, sack of Mohen, <laughs> Mohenhenji Daro. There you go, just giving like, give a bit of flavour. Although um, I have the feeling this is quite a bit more inland than I've drawn. There's a few artistic licences there. <laughs> right, let's just read a little bit from the book. Should we just dip in a second? Right. So therefore, if you take the story as that of a real ancient voyage preserved in a muddled version, this is the key. How much muddled up is it? Written up by Homer, we may get sense. Wait a second. It's a quick look. Are you reading the comments there? Make sure there's... Um... Yeah. Okay. Um, oh my goodness, don't tell me getting onto flat earth again. This works just as well with the flat earth model, all right? The whole journey does. It makes no difference. And you can circumnavigate either way. <laughs> so let's save that discussion for another day. And there's plenty of other places to have that discussion, all right? It, it really doesn't make any difference which one you prefer. Okay. Just need to have to change how you draw your map. I'll just demonstrate that very quickly because this come up a lot. Uh, if we've got a globe, that's the circumnavigation. And if I go in this way, North Pole is always on my left. All right. And I'm always heading east. That's what it feels like. If I have a, a flat pole in the middle and I travel around like that, I'll feel like I'm going in a straight line. North pole's still always on my left side and I still always think I'm going east. All right, so let's just back that one for another day, okay? Because it does wreck the chat and we can't stick to what we're discussing. Right, okay. So um, if, if there's any sense in the real voyage of Ben Anath, now this is the key person, Ben Anath, you can look up yourself. 
this is the ancient Egyptian story that um, is the original, what Wilson Black has shown, is the original Odyssey, or the original circumnavigation of the world, okay? So it'll probably emerge from the fantastical version preserved by Homer. So what, we, what the book is about, really, is trying to pull together information from the Ben Anath story, Ben Anath, and compare that with the Odyssey story, and then see if they appear to be the same, and can we make that story and journey work in a real world map all right so so there's any sense in the real voyage of ben Anath, it'll probably emerge from the fantastical version preserved by homer we have a lot more in homer than we have on the ancient egyptian further on in the tale the adventures are clearly in the southern hemisphere and here's the quote my friends i said east and west mean nothing to us here where the sun is rising from and from whence he comes to light the world and whence he is sinking, we do not know. They cannot even tell east from west. They don't know where they are. So here, without familiar stars to guide them, all sense of direct direction for the expedition is lost. The North Star, that invaluable guide to all sailors, was no longer visible to the set patterns of the skies, and ideas of east and west were primitive, without clear patterns of north and south. Much further on in the story, there is a passage that shows a phenomenon in the weather and daylight times that is peculiar to the regions of the Arctic and Antarctic regions. In this land, nightfall and morning tread so closely on each other's heels that a man who could do without sleep might earn double set of wages. So we're talking about the... the Ross, you muppet. <laughs> All right, you can read yourself now. Okay. Um, so journeying south for nine, so there we are, so much further on, in the nightfall and morning tread so close on each other's heels that a man who could do without sleep might earn a double set of wages. So the days just run into each other, it's very short nights. Journeying south for nine days, as described in the Odyssey, would not have been possible within the Mediterranean. Moving down through the Red Sea before attacking Mohenjo-Daro matches with the directions given by Homer, and the archaeological account of the trading city being destroyed in ancient times. Okay, so then we go on to the, this huge, huge, huge area then. This was Australasia, I've called it there. <clears throat> Hope you like the maps. My best colouring. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just read a little bit more from the book. One. So they've got very short nights and excessively very long days is a natural peculiarity of summer times in the far reaches of the north and south towards the poles of the earth. So, based only on that, it could well be in the north as well, like Eamon Wilkins says, it could have been around the North Pole, well, not around the North Pole, sorry, around there, Scandinavia and Britain. The complete absence of familiar stars by which directions could be established certainly means the ships have filled far to the south. That's the trump here. Everything written in the Odyssey is set down in a manner to match with the geographical concepts of the times in which the work was written. The landmass of planet Earth was thought to consist of Africa, Europe and Asia, that are all joined in one mass with a river of ocean thought to run around and to encircle this one total landmass. I think that's the kind of model that uh, uh, flat Earth people would probably identify with. They've got the uh, land masses in the middle and you've got this river on the outside and that's where we're going. As the voyagers crossed over this river of ocean, they had clearly moved away from these known land masses. Beyond this imagined river of ocean was a believed to be the lands of the dead, and Odysseus is then portrayed as actually visiting this dreaded place. But tell me, Searchy, who is to guide me on the way? No one has ever sailed a black ship into hell. It is the north wind that drives the ship onto the shores of these much feared unknown lands. If we examine the charts of the great currents which swirl and circle around the oceans of the world and take the prevailing wind patterns into account, it is probable that Odysseus visited a succession of the large islands scattered across the Pacific Ocean before finishing up on or near the southernmost tip of South Africa, South America. Sorry. So the journey seems to have been something like this. The island twice visited definitely seems to be Tasmania. If you know the story of Odysseus. So there's no way of knowing the exact route here. But we're bouncing around these islands and Borneo and places like that. Uh, and then hitting down through here. Now I have checked this. This is a route which is still done. Where you can... It, it's almost harder to miss the islands than to hit them. 
if you drift, you will drift into island to island, island group to island group to island group. The big stretch comes from there across to South America, of course. And it's, it's, it's fascinating when you look into it. One of the things I want to um, add to this, which actually, I'll just do it in a minute, is about the, um, this image I always had, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is that in the ancient times, the boats had to come into shore every night, so the best place to sail was to follow the coasts. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, is that um, it's assumed that they stay near to to the shore so they can see the land, and they wouldn't have to worry about navigation. And there's also the theory then that uh, every night the boats would be pulled onto the beaches so that people could get up, stretch out, have some food. Um, I don't know, dry the boats out, whatever they want to do. That seems to be a general thing that every night has to be docked. Now. Excuse me. There were a few things that really struck out read, listening to the, um, the personal accounts of the people on the Ra expeditions. Contiki was a balsa wood boat. The Ra expeditions are reed boats, okay? They have some wooden components like the masts and the rudders. But apart from that, and a couple of rails, apart from that, they're made entirely out of reeds. Absolutely amazing. And what they discovered, and I've got a quote ready here. Uh, for page 253, and it says here, I thought the sea got worse the farther out, but, so the further out from the shore he means, right? The further out we came, but it's the other way around, murmured Santiago. Among anthrop, although, oh, sorry, um, anthropologists often speak about how primitive sailors might have travelled to this or that place, as long as they could keep close inshore. But that's the worst place of all. What they discovered, and you could watch on the vid, uh, I don't think it's on the video, it was in the book anyway, was the, the only time they had real problems was when they got nearer to shorelines, because then you get the water chopping up, the currents, you get worse storms, everything was worse. And the best place to be is right out in the ocean. <laughs> unless you need some help or something that's a real problem and these floating well glorified rafts where they're balsa or reeds it can take incredible amounts of water it's i i mean it's remarkable that they um quite often during the journey they're up to their knees in water but the boat's afloat it's just got chipped around and water's come in so one side's caved a bit and they were learning all the time about how to make it work and there's a way they could have elevated their decks better I'll just say a quick thing about that, actually, because um, I should have drawn. I was going to draw a, 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 there's some drawings of uh, Egyptian ships. But one thing which absolutely fascinates me, and I have to share it, I'm going to do it with my hands <laughs> to try and get this across, okay? If you look at the, the drawings of ancient um, Egyptian boats, if you look at the front and the back of the boat, they're bent like this. I'm just checking on the screen, you actually see me. Yeah, you see the prows coming up like that, right? Now, the first thing was people were, um, people always assumed that's some sort of decorative thing or something like that. Or I mean, the front for cutting through the waves with the back one makes no sense. They did not know why it was there. So when they were making the boat, they pulled this up. They tried to recreate it and they got a rope and they're pulling it and 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 pulling it. They get it there, the thing sticks, and then the, the people who are making the boat, they got some helpers some guys who used to working with reeds. They didn't like this big, ugly thing, because on their lake ones, they just cut this off, because it's a nuisance. That's like a second sail and messes up their navigations. They weren't happy with it. So this rope, they cut off, all right? Now, it's like this. Now, if you haven't seen it, I wonder if you can have, have a little think a second, if you've never seen this, as to why these are here, what they do. They are not just pretty, and they're not to help with the buoyancy at all. And they're not necessarily to help with breaking the, the, the waves or anything like that. Has anyone now mentioned in the comments why they're there? Because <laughs> I think it's absolute genius. Absolute genius. And it's something that Thor Heyerdahl wishes they'd done because they realised uh, when they were getting absolutely soaked <laughs> and all the beds were underwater, why this was done, okay? So if everyone's going, anyway, the, the, the point is here that this rope on the, on the back, the stern end, ties to the um, <laughs> ties firmly to the center of the, the deck. 
particularly the sleeping quarters of the place you want it. And this acts like a huge spring. So that rope goes down to the deck and pulls it up. Because what they found was, as they were going along, their boat was gradually sagging. So the front was all right, the front stays up on the waves, and the back end just gradually sagged away like that. And what it needed was this tension to keep it up. And then it would have been a lot drier. But it didn't sink. <laughs> it just meant they, they got very wet. And they started putting boxes and sleeping on the boxes to get themselves above the water and all that. Why this guy, Thor Heyerdahl, didn't get more attention amazes me. And it's another one of these examples where... Um, yeah, I'm sorry to go on about it a lot because it's... Well, it, is, it couldn't be more relevant than to this story, could it? But I know we're mostly about Wilson and Blackett, but... Uh, Thor Heyerdahl was... I love his attitude because he realised early on that the mainstream or the professional academics and that were just going to ignore whatever he said and they just hated what he said. All his ideas about the way people moved around. Um, and he's like, okay, fine, I'll prove it. I'll, I'll make myself a boat and I'll do the journey and show you. And even then, they still wouldn't accept it. Even though now, because uh, he's, he's, been, he's been dead probably 40 years, I think. He's, oh, gosh, when was he born? 1950? can't remember but he's he's uh he's been gone for a while and uh, not even that long 20 years something like that but anyway the, um, he was he was showing that uh, populations had moved more than was expected and his main thesis was that people had moved from south america to inhabit the polynesian islands and they hadn't all come from asia for some reasons this is incredibly controversial even suggesting that possibility so so his job was to prove the boats could do it. Now, unfortunately, for um, the Wilson and Blackett book, nearly all journeys, including his, go the other way around the world. So it's quite difficult to get stuff going that way. So anyway, his he actually proved it, and his attitude is what I liked, because they couldn't get anywhere with the academic world, although he tried. And in the end, he said, right, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to write popular works for the general public, and they can learn, and they can enjoy the information, and they can make their own minds up. And I was like, that's the way to go. There's no point in worrying about what the academic um, situation is or getting acceptance or being ridiculed. Just just, just go with it. Intelligent people like yourselves, you don't have to be experts in the field, can look at information and decide for themselves, well, that seems reasonable or not, all right? And the, the ironic thing is, of course, um, towards the end of his life, I'm not sure how many were after he died, towards the end of his life, he got 11 doctorates in various universities and things. So you never know, there's hope yet. Alan is 90, so let's still hope he gets something like that. It would be good. All right, so this is the kind of route. There's a mention they go to uh, to hell and back, effectively. And they get welcomed well the first time, but not the second, which I think is a reference to the winds. And they've caught this wind. So they go through New Zealand, where rather sadly, um, any trace of people like the Waitaha, if you put that in the search, you see the video I did. Um, hello, <laughs> if you're out there, for the Waitaha. And the original populations of New Zealand who were pretty much wiped out by the Maori. Yeah, I know white people get blamed for everything, but the Maori have got a, a lot to hide on this one, a lot to be embarrassed about. And then from there, the, the, the tides will take you this way, okay? Never trust the archaeologists <laughs> to do what? Right, okay. I will read a little bit more, actually. Hang on a second. Where's the... Um, you're all about going to death and all this kind of stuff. So we come on the other side... Now, this is always one of those ones I always joke about that um, <clears throat> it's amazing how people are quite prepared to accept that uh, Easter Island is a tiny dot in the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's, you know, you have to zoom in even on Google Earth or something to find it. it people went there and you can see it. They built these um, Easter Island heads and all that. Actually, I'll talk a little bit more about um, <clears throat> Thor's ideas on this because his, his thinking is that... Um, they went the other way, <laughs> so they would have gone on, hang on, let's put that on there, I'm being slack tonight, aren't I, so we move from there, can read a bit more about this, okay, right, um, I want to come back to that in a second, so people have no problem with this little dot being found in the middle of the Pacific, middle of nowhere, but they have a lot of problem with the idea that um, people could find America, <laughs> which is like this enormous Enormous, enormous continent which goes pretty much from pole to pole and there's no real way around it. You're going to hit it. If you're sailing east or west, eventually you're going to hit America. It's 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 more difficult to avoid than hit, far more. Working out how to sail around this southern tip and looking for the northwest passage and all those things have led to the death of many, 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 many people over the years trying to do it. 
none more dangerous than this okay and this is the key this part here is absolutely key to the whole story in my view this is the most powerful <coughs> there's the ship one of my little sketches the ship trying to battle its way through the the narrow strait that's angie's favorite picture by the way got the original somewhere um i want where's my map here we go this is the map i want to show all right Strait of Magellan is one option. All these are dead ends, right? Ah, oh, man, it took me ages to draw this. It, they're, all, they're all dead ends. <laughs> they all just end up nowhere. And my goodness, I spent some time studying this. And this one, Desolation Island, I really want to uh, talk about in a second, um, separately. So this is, the so Magellan Strait is not as easy as you think to, to find. All right? And of course, Magellan and most of them sort of come this way. And we're saying that Odysseus or Senate, or sorry, the, the Egyptian guy, Ben Anath, have come this way. And the options he's given, which is an important passage of the, of the Odyssey, which I don't think is explained anywhere else. None of the other explanations, where it's the Mediterranean, or the journey took place up in the north, or it's something to do with Atlantis, or all these different explanations for the journey, none of them explain things quite as well as this i mean this island <laughs> is called to this day tierra del fuego tierra del fuego which means the land of fire homer actually calls it the land of fire in the book so let's look at a description of this okay all right here we go so i'm going to concentrate on this one passage because this this i think this is what convinced me wow this story works and i hope it does the same for you <clears throat> How far back do we have to go? Uh, right, okay, so he's gone. The people who meet him with civility and everything, that would be the Aborigines, it seems, of uh, America, of Australia. Mm. Right, so the king of that people, so he's talking now, I was going to get around this certain area, and what we're thinking has happened is he's talking about how to get around the southern tip of South America, all right? So the king of that people advised Odysseus quite clearly that he would have to attempt to sail around a fearsome cape. Well, there's only a couple of capes. You've got the bottom of Africa and the bottom of America, really. Well, the smaller capes, I suppose. And stated that only one ship had ever survived that journey. This is virtual certainty to be Cape Horn. So, this will come back. Remember the map, all right? Two ways will lie before you, and you must choose between them as you see fit, though I will tell you of them both. One leads to those sheer cliffs which the blessed gods know as the wandering rocks. Here, blue-eyed Amphitrite sends her great breakers thundering in and the very birds cannot fly by in safety. The other one, these are the two options. Even the shy doves that bring Ambrosia to Father Zeus, the beetling rocks takes toll every time they pass, while for such sailors as bring their ship to this spot, there is no escape whatsoever. The end is flotsam on the sea, timbers and corpses tossed in confusion by the waves, or licked up by tempestuous, destroying flames. <laughs> it's a choice for you, isn't it? Do you want to drown that way or get smashed to bits that way? So the term wandering rocks can be explained by the fact that there are two very similar and very well-known promontories on the southern tip of South America. And one is well known as the False Cape. Very important. Mariners who misidentified the false cape were in very grave danger and were fortunate to avoid shipwreck. The description very definitely sounds like Cape Horn and the terror of the place is further made clear. Of all the ships that go down to the sea, only as one has made the passage and that was the celebrated Argo, Jason and the Argonauts, homewards bound by a Aetes coast. And she would soon have been dashed upon those mighty crags is here for love of Jason and not helped to past. Hera, sorry. The king told Odysseus that it was a very dangerous, narrow passage between feared rock shores and, and side, and where the seas were unpredictably tempestuous. This is vital information in tracing the voyage of the Odyssey, as there can be no doubt that this sea passage is the Strait of Magellan. On the south side of this very dangerous passage between the southern Pacific and the south Atlantic is the Terra del Fuego, the land of fires, which is the description of the area given in the Odyssey. The trick is to avoid the three times a day whirlpool of 
Charybdis and to steer close to the other terror of Scylla. These are the key bits. It is the author's belief, and I agree, unavoidable that this now well-known channel is definitely the place of the legend of Scylla and uh, Charybdis. And detail like the unpredictable three times a day clashing tides from the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans rushing tempestuously through this unique narrow channel with steep, dangerous, massive rocky sides and no shores or beaches to offer any security are phenomenon that is not found anywhere else on planet Earth. It is a very dangerous seaway cutting through the southernmost tip of the continent. The tides of the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans do not coincide and therefore the natural sea canal can be totally unpredictably calm or suddenly violently turbulent in every direction. The passage between the two oceans is described as the place of the cave lair of the monstrous Scylla, who killed men from every ship that sailed through the channel. Opposite the rocks and cave of Scylla is the abode of a whirlpool monster named as Charybdis, who sucks down as spews up alternatively a lower rock covered in foliage, unlike the bare, smooth, sloped Scylla. Odysseus decided to risk going through this unpredictable and dangerous channel rather than attempt to go around the Cape Horn in his open sailing and rowing boat. I'm not sure to this, still not sure which is a safer route to take. Do you go down there or do you come all the way around the Cape Horn where you have it dangers of, um, well, frozen waters and dire? <laughs> it's pretty bad there as well. One point. Uh, I'm going to discuss this, this Desolation Island in part two. I might do, I'll do more on part two next week when it's all written up properly. Because this absolutely amazed me. I'll just give a little clue about it, okay? Um, there's everyone's homework for this week. See if you can find Desolation Island. Because I had a devil of a job finding that. Because Alan Wilson mentions it. And um, the most famous one is actually off uh, South Africa. And that seemed to be the one that I was like, oh my goodness, you stuffed this one up, Alan, you know. I remember this was a couple, God, a couple of years ago I did this, my goodness. All this time waiting to sort out the hieroglyphs and things. Anyway, um, the book's been sitting in their shelf for 30 odd years. I, I think it's worth a couple more years to make it right. And I'm learning all the time, as we all are. So I could do a better job now than what I'd done two years ago. Anyway, this place here is one of the ones mentioned. It seems to be mentioned by um, my Homer as they are entering the passage. And um, I'll, I'll go into it next week. But when I found out the research with the wonders of the internet and everything, it this is the spot. <laughs> this is the spot. And I would also argue that's the spot where you get the sirens, you know, the ones who are screaming out to um, Odysseus and drawing him into the rocks, and he has to plug his ears with the wax. Check that out. If you can find the information, I'll do it next week, okay? I better make a note of that noise. People are going to be like, I'm to Desolation Island. I've got to do that. Desolation Island. That should be my book. Because um, <laughs> I remember, I was thinking, oh, no, I can't believe Alan stuffed this up. I can't believe it, you know, and I was searching and searching. And then there's this dot on the map. This absolute just dot. And when you hear about what it used to be called how the name changed, how it's described, and how many ships have been wrecked on it. You're like, there it is. There it is. Exactly where it should be. And I don't think Wilson... Well, I think Alan Wilson was aware of it, and I don't know how. I don't know how he knew about it. Ah, amazes me. So, um, so there's the land of fire, this Terra del Fuego, okay? So then we're rushing down, um, and then you've got to come out. Now, the problem is, when you come out of here, the way the currents work is like a swirl. It's going to throw you off this way. So what do we think is there? All right. Oh, yeah, just a bit more research I did. This is the... Um, <clears throat> just to give you a better idea of what the close-up of that area. Straight to Miguel, and you just saw the detailed view of it. Drake Passage is to come all the way around here. Using the winds, and you've got a lot more sea room, as they call it. So you can tack and manoeuvre and try to smash into things, which is the biggest problem. All right. It's, it's, it's easier, but it's further south. I, I guess it depends on the time of year and icebergs and all that kind of thing. You'd have to speak to an expert sailor. But that could be the two choice being referred to. Cut through the strait or come all the way around here. The false cape is up here. And I'm not so sure how that... Um, actually, the false cape is about there somewhere. And that, you can find out about that with Magellan. I'm not sure if that's going to play into this story because we're going that way. So my guess is it's this or this. 
Okay. Right, now as we come through that, we have to... Um, hang on a second, I need to, where's the bit I want to come through here? So we've done the... So Odyssey states that the huge dangerous tides rip through the channel three times a day. Unpredictable times, which again matches. you got the Straits of Magellan. <clears throat> right, before the opening of the Panama Strait, Panama Canal, the Strait of Magellan was the dangerous alternative route between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Even so, many ships preferred to venture the passage around the Horn, even though that was dangerous as well. Both routes were hazardous, and most particularly to sailing vessels, because the, it's just the winds and everything is so unpredictable. The fact is, the fact, ooh, there's a typo. The fact is that Homer would have been aware of the voyage of Ben Anath, alias Simto Tefnacta, in the region, in the reign of Ramses II, alias Neko II, and he was blind, he may not have comprehended this was a voyage of circumnavigation of the earth. Because uh, he's blind, I missed that bit. Okay, so there's your choices. So what you're going to do then is you come spilling out of here, you're going to wham into the Falklands, which gets interesting, because that explains another mystery. Alright, so you're all about this journey. So you're, you're like, <laughs> Hang on a second, I'm just going to do this... Um, See, 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 I just mentioned it. The story in the Odyssey describes how Odysseus sailed his ships past the island of the Sirens, where all his crew had their ears muffled and stuffed with wax, so they could not be lured ashore by the dreaded Sirens. Odysseus himself was tied to the mast, and though he could hear the Sirens calling, he was unable to move and be lured to their destructions. Destruction. The story relates, we had no sooner put this island behind us when I saw a cloud of smoke ahead and raging surf, the roar of which I could already hear. The crew were terrified by the raging seas, the surf and the smoke, which is perhaps mist from the surf. This would in all probability be the island of desolation, as it is known today, on his port north side. <laughs> Man, I had to look hard to find this island. Ah, oh, because as you, as you, as, uh, if, if you are new, if you haven't worked it out by now, uh, my, my role in life is taking their work, editing it, producing it, and get to as many people as possible, share the information, and... One of the things I also do is try and, any time there's a, a, a reference or a mention to anything like this Island of Desolation, I will then try and find it, because Alan and Baron are shockers for not putting references. And if I go and ask them now about them, if they're not interested and can't be bothered, just publish it. <laughs> so it's like, great. I think it looks better with the references and explanations. So I did manage to find Desolation Island, and it does fit this to a treat. There's even even better than you think, all right? So thus we sailed up the straits, rolling in terror. From one side we had Scylla, and on the other the mysterious uh, Charybdis sucked, sucked down the salt water in a dreadful way. When she vomited it up, she was stirred to her depths and seethed over in her dreadful way. The description would appear to match the great tidal races rushing around the island at the western entry to the Strait of Magellan. See, the western entry. You're bang on again, Alan. The ox that rocks re-echoed to hear her fateful roar and six men were washed overboard. Okay, you can read some more about that one. Right, the next thing is now, if you remember, uh, well, if you don't <laughs> if you don't know the story of the Odyssey, why would you? Is that uh, they then have this situation where you can hear the, um, the lions. Now, this is an interesting one, right? Because uh, Marcel pointed out on this. Right, let's give a background first of all. So they're sailing along, next time they hit land, which we're arguing would be the Falklands, or the Malvinos, they came across uh, Zeus's lions, or Zeus's cows, he said, I'll take you to this island, Zeus's cows, sorry, you'll land there, but you must not touch my cows, they are sacred to me, Zeus. So you can hear the sound coming over the waters from a long way out, apparently, from the Falklands, you can hear the sound in this right season, of what we now call sea lions, or the females still called a cow, sea cows, of the Falklands, where they're baying and all this kind of stuff, and they, they could be, this is a bit genius, Ballon Wilson, this could be what is described in Homer as uh, cows. Because how else would, <laughs> what, what on earth would you think these things are? They wouldn't even have a name, would they? I mean, you do not find these things in Europe. So that's the idea there. Uh... Now, there's, there is more discussion in this, because then you have the whole uh, issue of whether or not they had tusks. Because at the moment, the one with tusks, they're only walruses, stuff like that. I think uh, Marcel did some work on this. She pointed out to me they're only in the Northern Hemisphere, 
I know Nisa in the Southern Hemisphere. There's, there's, there's a few things to work through, which we can discuss in part two. So a lot of discussions in part two. But this seems to be the cows which they were not allowed to touch. They could um, land there. Now, what happens in the story is they plant corn, which again is a South American crop. So they've just come from South America. So there's every chance that's where they got the corn from. Corn is supposed to have been, uh, thank you to Patricia Gilcash, thank you Patricia for helping get this book prepared. Uh, the corn can be traced back 7,000 years, you know, I, my views on chronology, but in the standard chronology, 7,000 years to South America where the native uh, grasses and stuff were harvested and crossbred, and over time we get the corn, which makes more. So the fact they've just gone possibly down the west coast of South America and then cut across the tip, would give, them, would give them plenty of access to get the corn. Because the difficulty they have, and this is where I need my, um, I won't scroll through the whole thing because it'll drive you bonkers watching this. Uh, okay, let's drop, it's horrible, it's now scrolls. But I'll take you back to this map again. Uh, the problem they've got, and this is described again in the Odyssey, is if you're here, Falklands, or Georgia, could be that, just as easily be that one, uh, it, it talks about this constant northerly winds. The winds are constantly against them. They are now desperate to get back up to the northern latitudes or back up to level with Egypt, and they can't because there's constant winds from the north keep pushing them down, pushing them down, pushing them down. They keep trying, if you read the account, they keep trying, but they can't do it. <clears throat> they keep getting driven back. They got the wrong one. They get very hungry. So in the end, out of desperation, they eat the... They eat some of the cows, which is supposed to have led to them being cursed and all this, all the artistic stuff that comes with it. But on my original map, I had them sort of hacking their way up here. But I, Wilson and uh, Alan already mentions this a bit in the text, all right? So it's um, I'm not criticising him. It's just they didn't draw any maps. And uh, he's now over 90. It's more, more difficult to discuss exact routes, but I've shown this and he seems happy with it. So <clears throat> the, the currents and the trade, uh, the trade currents and the winds would have taken them this way eventually and switched around there, okay? It's this massive long journey. He also find you can't, this bit's very difficult to get around as well. I was reading an account of someone trying to sail around Africa and this part was so difficult to sail around that in the end, what they do is they actually come out here <coughs> and loop back in again, which is what I would presume they would have had to have done in this ancient ship. <coughs> Even if it was a modern yacht, this is still really difficult to do that. What's that called? The equatorial counter or something. It's almost impossible to get around this bulge, as they call it. So one of the reasons the old uh, triangular trade used to work so well, because uh, you could pick up your cargo here, straight to the West Indies, straight back to Britain or Western Europe, and straight back down again. That works fine. Backwards, you can't do it. So it's a freak that triangular trade works. Hang on, so let's go back to where we were. So let me just scroll through all those pages, give you a headache. Okay. So this seems to be what it is, and you can see how the trade winds fit with that. It all fits with the journey so far. Press the wrong buttons. Pardon? Press the wrong button. So press the wrong button? button. You press the same button, then you press the title button. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's what could be the cows, all right? So I'll just say this. So Odysseus was anxious not to offend the sun god, and so he tried to persuade his crew to sail past these islands. So they're going past them, that makes sense, because the tide is taking them um, forever east. So Odysseus has acted a promise from his men that they would not touch these cattle of the sun god. Cattle of the sun god. No sooner they'd gone ashore, however, an enormous storm brewed up with great suddenness. Zeus, the cloud gatherer, sent a gale of incredible violence. He covered the whole land and sea with great clouds, and in a moment, the black sky had blotted out the world. And now, for a whole month, the south wind blew without a pause. And after that, we had nothing but southerly and easterly winds. So as getting back home from the Falklands required northerly and westerly winds, the sailors had a problem. Okay. So I've drawn this here. That needs to be redone, that map. Because now, as you've seen, I think the swell would have gone out there. All the way out there, back here. <laughs> and what we think is the Canary Islands might, as Alan Wilson surmises in here, 
be the um, actually the city islands. So instead of coming through the Canaries, might actually come down this way, and then the the prevailing uh, tide will take you along there, no problem. You get home, no problem. Okay, so then we can discuss. Um, then we got things about Thacians, and then we got different discussions about the tobacco and all this kind of stuff, and some contradictions. Uh, right, so the problems that we face today are founded on the fact that we appear to have a Greek version of an Egyptian story. And the Egyptian story was based upon the fact of a real voyage. So the proposition is that the, an actual Egyptian journey has been described and it's been rewritten to fit in with these Greek heroes and the war that took place um, in Troy, in, in the Anatolia. Sorry, my mind drifts off a second then. So the Greek version is geographically unsound from the beginning as it relocates the start point of this epic voyage from the Red Sea and into the Eastern Mediterranean. The Greek version is unconvincing and it can't be fitted into any of the locations described in the tale and in short is quite a ridiculous fable. If, however, the Odyssey is a Greek version of an original real-life epic of an ocean adventure setting out from Egypt at the northern end of the Red Sea, then there is a discernible real-life story hidden behind the fantasies of a typical Greek writer in Homer. <clears throat> Homer's version begins with an alleged voyage to a city named Azizmaris, inhabited by the Sconis people. This city is then located in northern Greece by Homer, and it appears to be invisible to every researcher. If, however, the voyage was a reality, and it was the journey of Brice at, yeah, at Dali, I haven't gone to that, which gives us um, how his name reads using um, Kamaraig, Welsh, to read the hieroglyphs. You can read it, Brice at Tali, which has a meaning in Welsh or Ben Anath, as the 19th century academics translated it. And we've got Simto Tef Nakta, which I've got a clue, starting out from the Red Sea and emerging from the Gulf of Aden into the North Indian Ocean, and the city that the expedition attacked may have been Chandudaro, or otherwise Mohanjadaro, of the Indus civilization. This would make sense, as these are rich and well-developed cities, as the story suggests. Might just have been out of real shock trying to get back. <laughs> Perhaps the Egyptian story of the shipwrecked sailor is where the Odyssey tale had its origins, and this is based upon the remarkable voyage that was completed in the reign of Ramesses II, or Necho II. It's another important point there as well. You've got the, the same story uh, repeated in two different places with supposedly different emperors, but it's clear the same story and the names have been changed. My goodness, it's 20 to 10. Wow. Well, I hope I uh, enjoyed that as much as I did. <laughs> I guess it sort of flew by. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I can see if any people are left still watching. That would be a clue, wouldn't it? So, any anyway, every geographical statement made in the Odyssey appears to be impracticable and often impossible. After attacking the city, the, seat the fleet sailed to a second city, which Homer locates in the northeast of Greece, driven from the lands to the northwest of Greece. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Again, this appears to be extraordinary and impracticable as it proposes ceaseless storms and gales that drives the fleet. Should it go, should it go, if this is your Greece, this is your Greece, this is my London slipping out there, my old London uh, tricks. So we're going to go from my east and west, probably the wrong way around, because which way are we facing me? This is Greece. So we're saying he's starting off from here. Let's read it again. Um, so the city's located in northeast of Greece, and then driven for the lands in the northwest of Greece. So somehow a storm has managed to drive people all the way around Greece and then back up the other side again. It's bonkers. It's just madness. It can't... The, 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 the mainstream explanation doesn't work. I'll also argue that the, the idea of it being around Scandinavian art, that doesn't work either. There's so many places it falls down. And I'm, I'm when I first read these notes a couple of years ago, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I've got to make this into a proper book. It still needs more work, I think, to make it into an, a, a full-size book. Uh, but... As a small book, it'd be great, and I think as a download, it'd be perfect. So I'd like to hear people's views on that as well. Would you be interested in the download? I hope so. <laughs> it's, been gonna, it's gonna be up. I was hoping to have it up tonight, but not quite there. Right, so it's gonna give a little bit of a summary. Right, so um, uh, the location of the Cape of Malia and the fleet being driven past Kithera is, we think, plainly improbable. After a three-day gale, then running before the winds for nine days, sorry, I got the number of days wrong, I said 40 days, didn't I? Apologies. For nine days, it is likely that the fleet would have finished up somewhere in the middle of the Sahara. <laughs> if you're in the Mediterranean heading south for nine days, you're going to smash through North Africa. That's the point. Instead, 
If the expedition had sacked a major city of the Indus civilization, the expedition would have been driven down south on the west coast of India for 12 days and in rounding the tip of the Indian subcontinent, they would have passed uh, Sri Lanka, formerly Ceylon. The next people who are encountered are described as the lotus eaters and folk who do not have an abundance of cattle and sheep herds do have a generally vegetarian diet and they do mainly live on fruit and rice crops. These folks are described by Homer as eating a plant that makes them mild and forgetful and it's not impossible that they were people who smoked or ingested opium or some other drug plant <laughs> like marijuana. I love the way Alan talks about things like this, a drug plant. Either way, the plant used appears to have had the qualities found in drugs today. Our development of the story is that the expedition was heading down south towards the Pacific Ocean. And then we recap. And there's more parts about who's who in the battle from um, Trojan War. So you can see who's who and who's related. He's all my drawings. <laughs> Let me, crawling up onto a beach saying, please, please, we're on a Polynesian island. Could you please save us? Ah, that does remind me of one other thing I was going to talk about. Yeah, hang on a second. Anyway, so there's more there. They've got the cannibals, the, the Aborigines. Um, different places, the records, loads and loads of stuff. It really is fantastic. And that's the end of part one. Woo! So I hope you enjoyed that. Right, the other thing, yes, there's one part of the book which jumped out at me just looking at it um, this evening. Uh, get ready for the show. Hang on. I'm almost in darkness. Let's just put a bit of colour on. And that is, there's one part of the boat where, um, it's the boat, the story where it describes the boat getting completely uh, shipwrecked and, and smashed up and uh, the crew being wiped out and Odysseus having to struggle to shore, where he rebuilds a new boat to carry on his journey after some help from the locals and stuff. Now, Alan just thinks that's a crazy idea, right? That's a bit of artistic license because, you know, how could that happen? But having the benefit of... Uh, doing more research on reed boats and who builds them and where you get them from. They're remarkably common in uh, Africa. In fact, anywhere. South America, if you look at South America, they build reed boats. Um, Africa, they build reed boats, whether it's in the lakes. Not so much on the shores, though. It's the inland lakes, mostly. Uh, sea travel is a bit different. They definitely build them there because the advantage of a lake is you, see, you don't need the big bow to hold up the sleeping quarters. Uh, sorry, stern. And you can paddle around a lake. There's no tides or currents to worry about. You don't need sails and all that kind of thing. So sea navigation is a little bit different. You've got to get back in the sea. <laughs> no matter how big a lake is, you can always hit an edge and walk home. You can't do that with a sea, all right? So it's a different kind of proposition. But the basic technology for building reed boats is there. And you'll see that um, uh, my new my new uh, hero, well, not hero, yeah, he's a bit of a hero, actually. Thor Heyerdahl. I admire his guts, bravery, and sheer hardness to survive the conditions he survives is that you can you can build a new boat you know you don't the great thing about it is it uh depending on larger boat you want they're not that difficult to make you need uh you need to be able to know how to do it what you need expertise mostly how to tie knots things like that and one of the things that's frustrating on this and i haven't really followed up the research on it yet because there's so many things to cover but um is that when they, it's a good example, just to finish with one example of where practical experiment and common sense beats theory and academic research. Because when the research was, I'll use this pencil, um, they did an experiment. So you could do this experiment. Actually, where would you get a read from? I don't know where you get a read from. You can do the other things similar. Um, yeah, try it with a bull rush or something. Actually, that would be a good experiment. I might do that. Right, so if you've got your reed, you cut it. This is the vulnerable point where you cut it, all right? Because this reed clearly is designed to stand in water. Usually it's, it's uh, not salt water, though. So what the experts did, they got buckets of salt water and put the reeds in the salt water to see how long they would last. And what they discovered, they lasted about two weeks maximum before they, what they thought the salt water cause them to decay, all right? What uh, Thor Heyerdahl realised, and also the people who make these boats and have been doing so for hundreds and hundreds of years, like people from Chad, real right, centrally uh, landlocked parts of Africa with giant lakes, what they discovered was if um, the weakness is this bit, the bit you cut, that's where the water gets in. So if you tie that bit extremely tightly, 
extreme, they're very tight knot, and you should see that, that's what they cool at doing is their knots, it's brilliant. To see, you realise why the human body's designed how it is when you see them doing these knots. They've got big strong teeth, and they pull with their teeth, they've got their feet, um, and their toes hooking on the knots, so they can use two hands to pull. How they make the rope, the strength and everything is fantastic. And you're using all four limbs and your teeth, an enormous amount of expertise and technique, and it's the knots are the key. And what that does, that makes that sealed so the water can't get in. So what you then do is you've got your first layer of reeds. You start with the reeds, you split and make like that. And then the next reeds, each subsequent reed gets shoved in at the cut end like that. And tight, 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 and then bound again, again, again. And then we start shoving into this layer like that. And tight, 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 tight. And as long as the water doesn't get in through the ends, they seem to be able to last months and months and months. It's, it's indeterminate how long they would last like that. And you can, if your boat's falling apart for some reason, it's the ropes that have to hold. And that's the joke with the Africans and that. If the rope holds, the boat holds. And if the boat holds, we don't sink. <laughs> it's only when the ropes rot. And the way they make those, they get the fibres and they twist them and twist them and twist them and twist them. So it's a fascinating business. I didn't expect to um, be getting into reed ship boat building. And I have no particular uh, desire to build one or sailing one, but I'm interested to see, uh, to see one and if someone else wants to have a go. So, um, so that's another one there. All right, so thank you very much for that. Thank you on... Um, wow. Yeah, there we are. It's good stories tonight, wasn't it? Hey? Peter Wilson and Blackett, quarter to ten. <coughs> right. Uh, the Great Migrations is being edited at the moment. Brilliant. Good to hear it, Marcel. Yeah, I'm happy to get some input on that as well. Thank you, darling. Oh, 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 oh. oh my left arm's injured at the moment. Can't use my left arm. I've got, ironically, what's called golf elbow. It's ironic because I played golf for decades and I haven't played it for years and years and years. And I've got to be careful. I think it's from holding books. I think I've got a book reading injury. I tend to hold books like this in my left hand, so at a good height, so I can scribble my notes on everything, and I think that's what's um, done my elbow. <laughs> anyway, look up uh, more of these things. Right, okay, um, you're editing it, Ross, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Marcel, yes. I, I, was, I was wondering about that then. Great show, Charles, so the book sounds interesting. Now, this is the point I'm supposed to go right now, is click on a thing and get the download, <laughs> and then everyone puts, uh, only give me a £5 to go, that's all, but that's for both parts. All right, because part two as well, which I might cover next week. I've definitely got to get that down already. People yes. People wonder if you can make Marsha like a sort of admin so she can put, add links to the chat. Oh, right, yeah, good. Let's use your account, though. I don't know how you do these things, but um, if someone, we look into that. Yes, we do need some help on, uh, on stuff like that, don't we? Yeah, so. I know how to do it. It's just use your account. Oh, you need to be my account to make you an admin or something like that. Yes, All right, I'm okay, admin. tell you what. Your job, you have to remember, tomorrow... We're going to do this tomorrow, okay? okay. You're going to show me how to do it. <laughs> right, on a quick look at the comments, let's do a good system. Um, wow, there's loads of comments tonight, aren't there? I love the chat. i got a horrible feeling the chat got a bit distracted tonight, but I would like to see those links and that. And uh, Is that right, then? You can't... Um, I don't fancy milk in a walrus. <laughs> Very good. Right, how far back am I going to go on the comments? Okay, so we'll be covering in new stuff now. I'm just going to... Um, is there anything new to mention now? Uh, oof, gosh, sorry, my face suddenly appeared. Is uh, wow, we got loads of viewers online. Fantastic! Wow, I think that's the highest ever. Brilliant. I hope you're enjoying the show. Uh, you can go to cameraglyphics.com. You see, oh, one thing to show. Up, oh, Leon. Oh, I this, this is keeping nice and flat for tonight. Oh. We have. If you click on the, there is merch available. Look at this. Unfortunately, it's the hottest day of the year, and I've got this thing. Leon. <laughs> Excuse me, I think there's laws about beating children now, unfortunately, aren't there? Yes. But this... <laughs> they're looking at me laughing. This is... Uh, <laughs> fear. One word from me and they do whatever they like. Hang on a second, let's move this out the way. And a model, I'm not going to put it on, though, because it's too blinking hot today. But look at this. Can you see that? Hang on. Oh, the delay, the lag is enormous. Can you read it? Yeah, the lag's got worse, isn't it? Can you read it? There we are. Let's go for a simple one. Hieroglyphics are in Welsh, you mummy. <laughs> well, I thought it was funny anyway. I like it. <laughs> so you can get those as well. Usual thing. Go through the, the website and click on the store or something. I might get some mugs done or something like that as well. 
Right, okay, I'm going to go back. Right, we'll do some chat now, okay? So I'm kind of finished on there. So you can, uh, do you want to play us out? You got, to, you got anything ready? I haven't rehearsed anything. Just play something. There we go. Oh, by the way, everyone, uh, Z- Zavi's done his, his violin less, uh, exam a couple of days ago. So he's not picking them up for a while. <laughs> so he won't be Zavi this week on violin. <laughs> he's only a couple of weeks off. Right, I'm going to go back quite a way. Um, right, okay, I'm going to go back now. So this is like the bonus bit, if you like. A bit of music, say goodnight. I'll do you my head, and all that kind of thing. But I quite like a bit of chat at the end. I enjoy the comments. The people say they like this part of the show, so let's do a bit more of that. Right, I can't go back to the beginning because they just won't let me. <laughs> There's one reason. Okay, so thank you very much to everyone for joining me tonight. I hope you enjoyed that. Please buy the download. And if you want to donate or anything like that, we do need something to keep us going because the books and donations is the only income we have, all right? And this is a full-time job, as you might have realised. And we have to get this out there. We have to get this history uh, just to keep it going. And, as, and I have to mention, there's one person out there, I have to keep anonymous, who made a very generous gift. Thank you very much. I really took the pressure off this month enormously. So um, thank you for that. Um, shame I can't mention your name, but there you go. Right, let's have a look. Right. I'm a globalist who hates globalism. Okay, Robert Kingston, you got me there. DJ Lee, keep your flat... Ch- oh, right, no more flat earth chat. <laughs> Andrew Wynn, if the earth was flat, cats would have pushed everything off it by now. Thank you, Leon. That's not bad off the cuff. Go on, do another one. Do it your um, boogie boogie stuff or something like that. Just just give me some noise just to while we're riding down. Ah, right. The original Finky, no relation. No relation. What's that mean? No relation to Finky. I, Finky, Finky approved is my favourite thing on my videos. And I did uh, did send an email to ask, where are you, Finky? I haven't had a Finky approved for ages. And he's okay. Everything's fine. So hopefully we'll see. He just can't do Sunday evenings anymore. Right. Is Right. This kind of question I love. Does anybody know of any ancient Cymru myths about flood? Yes. Besides the Bible, like pre-Bible, do any records exist? They certainly do. And that might well indeed be a subject for next week, because that is, um, because my brain has gone a bit fried at the moment, and I was reading about this just a couple of days ago. Thank you, Leon, that was lovely. And, um, bedtime. I'm going to play some more, I thought you might when I said that. (laughs) Uh, yes, yes. Uh, this was going to be the alternative topic for tonight, funny enough, so thank you for that question, it's perfect. You've got, uh, going all the way back to who on and the floods and everything, it's all in the Mabinogion. It's just that people don't realise when they read the Mabinogion what it's about, or the Mabinogi as it should be, not even Magbinogion. And I have the next download book, <laughs> which is going to be explanation of the Mabinogi, all right? I'm, the plan is, let's say the, the plan from now on, what I'm going to try and do is produce these books in smaller sections so we're not waiting six to eight months for a new book. And hopefully we can do at least one a month, maybe more, I put myself under pressure again. And, uh, oh, excuse me. Oh. Oh, I do apologise. Ah. And um, there'll only be a couple of pounds of no, that's all. So hopefully accessible to everybody. And if you can sell a few hundred of each one, I'll pay to keep everything going. So, you know, we're not trying to be millionaires or anything. So a couple of pounds download, do the books in sections. And Mabinogi and the flood stories and everything is... I've been reading about that all week. It's absolutely fantastic. It's not just in the Mabinogi. It's like one of the main themes that runs through it. And you can read... Um, you want to read in the story of Bronwen. Uh, and you've got the, the the 12 ships coming across the sea from Ireland. And the 12 ships, what they represent. And then you've got this the sea coming in and the waves. You know, and they cut the tails off the horses. And then it becomes a swamp. It's brilliant. It's... Alan Wilson, genius, at his highest, explaining how these really weird Mabinogi stories, just makes no sense at all, are all in there, okay? So that's important. Oh, yes, also you get August the 27th, the plug, and I do apologise to Hugh Evans. We need to get together and sort out the details of what's going to happen for this speaking thing on August 27th. I'm thinking if people are going to travel, maybe we should make an all-day event and have some things in the day, just a bit of lunch or something, chance for us all to have a chat and get together, as well as... Hugh speaking in the evening and possibly me speaking in the evening although people see a lot of me speaking <laughs> on this channel already so I think it's something a little bit different that's what I'm trying to think right so no need to be embarrassed on that one it's brilliant uh, what else we got here right 
Um, Michelle Abrams, the British Cymru. Try the book by Reverend Morgan, the British Cymru. I base my Noah videos on his information. Very good. Okay. So this is what we're saying about not being able to put links up, is it? All right. Okay. I will try and work something out. I need to speak. To, I, was, I was going to give you a call this afternoon, Marcel, but uh, as you can see, time was against me. All right. Okay. Let's have a... Yeah, leave the flat earth talk. Right. Steve Franken, this seems to follow the journey of the hero from the known to the unknown, as described by Joseph Campbell. Ooh, I don't know much about that one. Oh, I see. Can we make Marcella moderator? Right, that's what you need to do, apparently. Yeah, that's it. I can do oh, it. Oh, you know to do it. All right, okay. Oh, I see. We need to be logged in as me to do it. All right, okay. Well, we'll sort that out. All right, yeah. You just click on the name, and then you just click the make moderator. Can I do that, then? Yeah. Oh, no, you just broke... Oh, no, you broke the notebook. Oh, 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 oh wow. Show the people this a second, quickly. <laughs> Look what he's done. I just tapped you. I'll just tap you now. Look at this. Look, 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 look. Look what he's done. Oh, my goodness. hope your mother's not watching this. She is. She is watching. <laughs> Better be you than me, mate. <coughs> I think I'll turn it off and back on again. I'll yeah. give it a... I don't know. That looks dead. That's not a good sign. Right. Um, so there we go. Right. It's easier to sail in open seas. Yes, it is much easier. Has anyone tried ringing... Anyone tried ringing it's Ross? Uh-oh. Oh, There's IT know. departments appealed. Uh-oh. Furious. It's okay now. It's okay. It's okay now. I think we need David Church. I think we need some sessions on non-Euclidean geometry and spherical geometry and extra dimensions so we can realise the Earth is both flat and level and also round. Wow, that Dow. There. Right, David. Make the video. <laughs> Make the video and I'll put a link up and you can explain all that, all right? Because my head's bur bursting already. Um, enough trouble. I have enough trouble with normal uh, geometry. One of my, one of my favourite subjects, but uh, when you start doing it in three dimensions, oh, it gets difficult then. Uh, right, okay. Their feet must have suffered from the salt water. Yeah, you'd think that, wouldn't you? But if you watch it, um, I, I haven't read the very end of this book yet, so I shouldn't jump to conclusions, but they all look great. They look absolutely fine, in great shape. Really good spirit, you know, so... Um, I don't think being stuck in salt water seems to be that bad, amazingly. They, 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 at the end of this second journey, when they got the hang of making the boat and everything, they were in no trouble at all. They had loads of, um, they had so much extra food and that, because they used these big heavy jars, that when the back of the boat started sagging, they actually chucked them into the water. Well, it was quite ironic, because they go around complaining about ecology and saving the sea, and then they were chucking all this stuff in the sea. But yeah, so, um, I think the damage done by a few clay pots doesn't really count against the oil damage and all that kind of thing. Okay, we need to make some more mods. Okay, right, right we shall look into how to do that. Leon's all over it. Um, <laughs> it's pointed at both ends, you can either direction. That makes sense. That makes sense as well. Um, is th It's there for a sale, the end of the good guess. Oh, these are all the guesses when I said it does this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the biggest problem with um, the reed boat, actually, was not the reeds. It was all the wooden bits snapping. The, 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 the oars snap, the... the the mast snapped, so I wonder if any of it was meant to be uh, wood at all, including those big steering oars. I don't see how else you could do them, no? Uh, let's have a look. Right, okay. Get me on Facebook or IG or... All right, okay. Um, Marcel, I was glued to Hyadell's voyages in the 70s. He was a hugely important influence on me. Yeah, well, I didn't know so much about him, but um, I'm... Coming on to him now, I'm going to try and get the, his first book as well. Because <laughs> I don't have enough books to read. Oh yeah, I must say a thank you, sorry, as well to um, uh, Lyndon sending this as a present. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, interesting book, which I'm working my way through as well. Which is History of Wales. And this is published, I think I remember off the top of my head, 1910. Which makes it interesting. And anything before the 1920s. Oh, I got that completely wrong. So you always check your references. Oh, 1911. Oh, only one year out. That's not bad. 1911 is published in Pontypridd. Mine Gwyr Eile. And um, an erring queen of Glamorgan's monument in Scotland. So I imagine that would be the reference there to uh, Gwynoiva fleeing from Myskin with her boyfriend to escape the wrath of um, Arthur and Oyt of Scotland near Whithorn where he rode it down and being a pleasant chap he is, apparently fed her and a fella to the his hunting dogs. So there we go. Oh yeah, press the like button. Yes, please. Thank you very much. It all helps people find the channel. 
Uh, right, what else we got here? Uh, could have, yes, when the Earth spun in the opposite direction, pre-magnetic pole flip. DJ Lee, yeah, when we start putting that in as well, it gets very uh, interesting. Oh, Easter Islands, thank you, Laurie. I meant to say something about it. The other thing that um, Thor Heyerdahl is proposing is that the Easter Island heads were built by people from South America. Just put it out there, okay? Ah, right, thank you, Taliesin. RB, please speak to a seagoing pilot. Right, <laughs> are there any seagoing pilots out there? You understand how to get around the sea uh, without engines. Only trouble these days. Everyone's used to engines and computer navigation, aren't they? I'm probably going to need some old boy who's used to, a, yeah, a sailor you want, really. And someone does one of these round the world things. Where's that, um, what's the name, Erin or something, wasn't it? The the woman who uh, went all around the world. She was quite cool. She'd probably have a good idea how to do this. If the window's distorted as per wide angle elements and show the rise in the... T oh, we're we back on that again. Look, I'm not going to go into the flat earth thing, all right? I'm nothing against it. It's just not for here, okay? Uh, I think we're almost done, I think. On the, is there any more comments, questions, please? Right. Southeast wind in one place. Wind gets over 200 miles an hour. So where are you, Laurie? Around the Horn. Yeah, always shipwrecks around there, weren't they? Uh, one of the... See, that, right, on the comments, you have to put a little bit more explanation, okay? Because someone's put, oh, RB, no, there is one way through there. And I have to try and remember which part we're talking about then, which I assume is going to be the Magellan Street. Okay. Uh, right, without oceans, Earth looks like rubber chicken. <laughs> Not the whole Earth. Oh, no, you whacked it again. It's soon wrong with this, isn't it? Okay. Ross, shipping from Japan to... No ah, here we go. Shipping from... This is a kind of comment. Squirrel Sniper. Shipping from Japan to North America ends up on the east coast of Canada... Not west. All ships go via the Cape of South Africa. Wow. So if you're going from Japan to North America, you'd end up on the east coast of Canada. That can't be right, surely. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you opened a new thinking <laughs> rabbit hole for me there. <laughs> Squirrel. I'll have to look into that one. Ships leaving Japan for North America end up on the east coast of Canada. Wow. Wow. That's, 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 that's just nuts. I know no one likes this early map I had, all right? And I'm not claiming it's a great map for showing how the world works. It's just useful for currents. If someone's got a better one, I'm happy to use it. It's not like um, <laughs> I've set my reputation on this map or anything. So Japan, which great. Managed to just, oh, here we go, Japan. So from Japan here... We can't just go to America. We have to go via there. Right, I can't say that works. You're going to have to explain that to me sometime, okay? Because we're saying they're going to go via... So what... I think what Squirrel's saying is you have to come via... Below South Africa. Then all the way up this way. And end up there. Somewhere. Wow. Wow. That is nuts. That is nuts. I can't comment on that. <laughs> but, I mean, Squirrel normally puts stuff which is correct, so I'll have to um, look into that one. Right, some general chat. Right, you can't have a first world nation with a third world pop. Oh, okay, demographics is destined. Right, isn't the African Cape a lot further north and out of the high-speed wind latitude? Right, okay, David, you might be right on that one. I think I'm not out of my depth. Again, it's a navigational chat now. Right, okay, well, I think it's getting pretty late. It's almost it's gone, 10 o'clock. Uh, another question from Lightning Turtle was Antarctica Jutenheimer, the land of the frost giants, another Norse link. I will say one thing on that. I, I don't know, uh, is my straight answer on it. Uh, this was the first thing I worked in with Ross, a taste of things to come. Yeah, it's, it's taken all that time, Marshall. I still haven't finished the bits I want to add to it. This is one of those subjects where I just keep digging in and digging in, like looking at currents and South American maps and. Oh, my goodness, how sailboats work and reed boats and wooden boats. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I guess that's just where my mind works. It didn't make this job any easier. I could just stuck it up as an essay, 60 pages, whatever, boff. Uh, it would have taken no time at all. But anyway, it, it, it's such an interesting subject. I think it's worth... What I mentioned in the forward earlier, 
Most, if most historians or researchers had discovered this, they would have spent a lifetime researching this one journey, producing book after book after book, and you know, doing the old Thor Heyerdahl perhaps, and experimenting and see if it'd work, all those kind of stuff. It's just Wilson and Blackett, they got so many things going on, so many subjects, which I'm now trying to pick up and edit, that they didn't even bother telling people about this one much, really. It's just stuck in the back of a folder. It's just bonkers. I, I really think they'd forgotten about it when I brought it back. I said, hey, do you remember doing this? Like, oh, yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? What do you think? And I said, well, I think, I think it's amazing. I think it's a, one of those really, really, really important things that should be out there and published, is what I think. And they're like, oh, yeah, good up then. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's a bit strange. It's just one of those, really. I, this one you could really spend years and years and years researching and looking more and more into. And then you go on to the other stuff then, of course, because the contact with Australia and do the Gosford links give any clues about the journey? Short answer, yes, I think they do. I think you can see evidence in hieroglyphs to describe what happens in this story, so that ties in. New Zealand ones, I'd love to see, but unfortunately, Tim, if you can get the contact, Tim Wilcox, uh, the Waitaha people and that, they, all their stuff's been just completely suppressed and uh, the Maori have been bulldozing over caves and all sorts of things, so... I think we're a bit of a dead end on New Zealand. Well, I've been trying for two years now, and I've been trying for two years to get those Gosford Park pictures, which, um, thanks to Dave Sospenbach, we now have. So thank you very much. Dave going all the way down there. He wasn't very well. Took the photographs and sent them through. So these things do take time, and what they need more than anything is teamwork and help. So thank you very much to all those who tripped in and, and share my enthusiasm to find these things. Right, Marshall Abrams, I think I'm right in saying that Thor Heyerdahl undertook his journey to prove that the reed boats of Egypt and the reed boats of Lake Titicaca had a joint ancestry. Um, I, yeah, I, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it shows they both used the same technology. I don't know if they both learned it the same way. I'm not sure you, you know better than me on that. It definitely shows that they used very, very similar techniques to make the reed boats, so... They either both discovered it, which is, um, what do they call what do they call it, parallelism or, or isolationism, or you go with Thor Heyerdahl, which is diffusionism, which is by one person finds something out and then the technology spreads out. So uh, take your pick on that one. <laughs> Sean Lock tribute pun. A bowline reef knot. Well, I'll, I'll take a word for it, Squirrel. I, I got my knots and lashings when I was a Boy Scout, dib, dib, dib and all that, but I really can't remember much about them. I said to do everything with a reef knot. Right, see, David Church, around the edges of lakes around here, plenty of reeds and rushes and some marshes and withies. I don't know where you are, David, but yes, you can make them anywhere, I think. Oh, I see in Britain, I think you are, isn't it? So we've got reeds. Uh, can't wait to watch on catch-up. Thanks, Gary. Right, thanks, everyone. Yeah, book, book on Brutus and Albi and the Great Migration has been edited at the moment. Yes, I am working on that. I did do an edit, didn't I, in fairness? Right, a turn around two half inches will. I think the my um, my comments is broken. Right, okay, well that's enough anyway. I think it's getting late. I still can't get this one to bed because I got to chase him up the stairs. So um, <laughs> do you want to get ready to put your hand in front of the camera? Okay. Come on, you. Which button I got to press? We get the right one this time. Hmm. Um, I think it's number two. I think. Two, you think? Yeah. I think. No, it's not. Two, share the screen. Uh, three. Quite <laughs> well, hurry up! You got to put your hand over there. Look, are you going to wave goodbye with the puppets? Are you? Yeah. Leon's into puppet making now. Zoe took the other one. <sighs> I see. Never work. You're supposed to wave goodbye with the camera. That is just my favourite one. <laughs> so I got to hold this. Oh. Well, this is what easier. To do. This one's more easier. That one's easier. Yeah. Bye really bye. Bye bye. This is a serious history program, you know. I can't be having like Dick Darsley waving goodbye to everyone. I mean, where's well, my respect? Credibility's gone, isn't it? I mean, you know. You know that. All right, bye bye. So we, I'm going to make a full uh, Kermit this week, apparently. Not we didn't make this one, but you made. What have you done? Then you made an extra arm for him, and it which suddenly works. All right, there you go. Well done. There we are. Bye bye. Go on, do the camera quick, quick, quick. You can, you gotta, no, you gotta go around. You gotta go around. I can't reach him here. This is the problem now. What you don't pull out? The, oh. I mean, you know, what can you do? <laughs> what can you do? It's just a disaster. What's wrong with you? You've got to put your hand on the camera, haven't you? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
Honestly, it's rubbish, isn't it? Dreadful. It's supposed to be a professional show, okay? We had over 2,000 views last week. None of this amateur rubbish, all right? It's going to be a professional. We're going to do this properly, all right? <laughs> We're looking for professionals. Ah, oh, dear. You're, you're out. Right, okay. So, looking like this, and I go, so till next time, no star, everybody, no star, Pope. Hello. All right, now we have to wait now. I'll actually, see. Yes, it works. There we are. You're not fired. You can come back and do come again. Right, the pay's pretty lousy, so. <laughs> All right, I'm um, a bit confused what to do now. Is there any chat going on? Because my chat's not working. Oh, yeah, there's a couple of people saying goodnight. My puppets go to National Cadet Camps with me. <laughs> All right, everyone, a bit of a bizarre ending to the night. Uh, quarter, oh, there we go, 10 o'clock. So I'll get this download. This is going to be me for the next couple of days doing the download to get it ready so people can... Um, don't. So I'll leave the chat on for a few minutes while I get these rascals up the stairs and I'll come back down and switch off so just to give people a chance to say goodbye or continue their chat, maybe swap email addresses or something like that because I'm very, 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 very keen for everyone to get to know each other directly rather than just via me or via the channel. It's not meant to be like a hub and spoke. It's like loads and loads of people all getting busy and making little groups and doing their own research and producing books and films and all that kind of stuff, all right? So more the merrier, and uh, till the next time, <laughs> I'll say goodnight again. I'll definitely go in now. Time to turn the microphone off. Right, hello.